Okay, good afternoon. I would like to, uh, first of all, thank, is that too loud? Thank Miga Parjuli and uh, David Hogue for their wonderful cooperation with this uh, symposium, really making it come to life in a way we didn't think possible. And I'd also like to thank Frank Franklin for his wonderful presentation and the other presenters, many of whom contributed their own um, their own matching funding in order to come. And most of all, I'd like to thank the ESA for con contributing. And not to forget David Grather, who has um, succeeded in um, goading me, encouraging me to join with him on the symposium and uh, take a big piece of the um, symposium process. And so I also wanted to thank our timer who and my student, Kifeng Lung, and uh, I really appreciate all of your presence here today on this final day of this uh, conference. Okay, I want to recognize Gene DeFaliart also and thank him from the bottom of my heart for the many roles that he's played in my own life beginning um, about 48 years ago. He was my professor in medical entomology and uh, then he went on to be de my department head when I was a PhD student and the founding editor, of course, of the Food Insect Newsletter who um, twisted my arm in 1995 to become the next uh, food insect newsletter editor, and then to join with David and myself to, um, I guess we could hold that up again at this point, um, to become the editor of this book that we affectionately refer to as the Chronicle of a Changing Culture. And I guess we have a few books that um, could be purchased. And then we have more coming from our second printing next week. And there's somewhere out there a sign-up list that's very pink sheet of paper. There's the list of, that's the list of people. And then there's another list, I don't know where it is, but just see David or me if you want to be on that list. Okay. Um, it pleases me uh, to share with you a few photos here also. Um, Jean had a lot of friends in Section B and uh, some of you are here today and I appreciate that. Um, and uh, also these are the um, symposium speakers including Mike Fink who are, uh, uh, who were here when Jean was with us the last time at the ESA meetings. And now it pleases me to share with you that I've been an entomologist for 44 years. I've been publishing in ESA journals for 43 years, and I've had a number of um, committee assignments, including chair of Section B and chair of the, the American Entomologist, and received a number of awards at regional level ESA for teaching and national level for research and um, on food security and also in anthropology. And for 29 years, the past 29 years, I've collaborated uh, every year with smallholder farmers, both men and women, in first South China and then uh, North, West, and East Africa. So in our ESA culture, I might be considered an elder. In the Society of Entomophagists, which is an informal grouping, I might be considered a very junior elder following uh, Jean de Faliar, to all of you here who were his students, and Julieta Ramos Elodroy, and probably Tom Turpin and Mae Berenbaum. But in that position, I believe it is our responsibility to point out a serious message. I've seen, as David said, a harmful suppression. I've seen it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears, a suppression of biological control and natural pest management. And this has happened among us, and I'm sorry about it, but it's over, and I'm happy that we've moved beyond that. But as David said, and probably intimated, that I really have a very serious worry, and that is, about another issue that seems to be similar. I'm embarrassed 
in this one way, very sadly embarrassed, to be an entomologist. How, I ask myself, are entomologists contributing to world hunger? Not until I saw the process with my own eyes in people of a way different part of the world, but people I care a lot about, did I realize the seriousness of this issue. So I ask you, are entomologists contributing to world hunger? How many entomology departments in the United States have subspecialties in food, insect, and nutrition? I don't know. I don't know of any. How many entomology departments are linked with health and human nutrition departments? Is this an unreasonable combination, and why? How do entomologists contribute to the Western attitude about food insects? by the choices they make on grant panels, on foundation boards, as professors designing topics to teach the new generation of world leaders, or as senior research scientists deciding on the direction for their own research. What is, what is the Western attitude? Who are Westerners? Well, Westerners are a small group of humans, probably 0.5 billion Europeans living in Europe and people of European descent living in the United States and Canada. Westerners' opinions, as David has said, about food production and food um, consumption have had a very strong influence on practices and preferences and food ability or food availability among non-Western cultures. In many of these non-Western cultures, of course, you know, storytelling is really important. And so uh, I wanted to take a few moments to tell you to tell you a few stories. I have some students who enjoy uh, sharing their stories in um, campus-wide courses in which we uh, work with in action research, communities in Mali and um, northern Native American reservations in Montana, and another 35 to 40 students who prepare and participate in insect food insect luncheons and debates in a campus-wide set of activities. And they do collaborate with uh, students in human nutri nutrition and their professor uh, who join with us in these endeavors. All of these are core courses at the university, and so they provide a university, um, uh, satisfy a university requirement. So I'll go quickly. There's a lot of stories. I'm not going to be able to tell you all the stories. I'll just allude to them very quickly. The Northern Cheyenne have stories about traditional foods and how they were taken from them as well as language and many ceremonies in a forced assimilation. Diabetes, obesity, alcoholism arrived. The Ute people um, have another story which is um, not as, it takes place about the same time but of a different nature. Uh, these folks were occupying the area we now call Utah and shared their knowledge with the people, uh, the Caucasian Americans who arrived about the later 1800s in the area of the Great Salt Lake. And uh, some of my students I asked to go back and ask their grandmothers about their grandmother's knowledge. And of course they talked about the crickets and the, um, <clears throat> the, that came and ate everything and how they went to the Native Americans and asked them how to survive in this desert area. Well, there were other uh, Caucasians who um, put their words into um, uh, documents that we can now um, access. And I'm going to quote from uh, William Brewer, a professor of agriculture, who spoke this way, and I quote, the Indians gave me some, uh, meaning these, um, uh, the, he said the Indians came from far and near to the shores of the Great Salt Lake and they picked up worms, which were actually the, the 
crickets that were dried in the sun. They rubbed them together and the shells fell off and left a little yellow kernel. And uh, he said, quote, the Indians gave us some. It didn't taste bad. And if one were ignorant of the origin, it would make fine soup. Well, a little later, uh, or a little earlier than that, in the 1841 period, um, another pioneer by the name of John Bidwell looked in the same area and said, well, you know, uh, this manna looks like uh, it's very interesting. And he, he wrote, I quote, the Indians gathered the honey, pressed it into balls about the size of one's fist, having the appearance of wet bran. At first, we greatly relished this Indian food, but when we saw what it was made of, that insects pressed into the mass were the main ingredient, we lost our appetites and bought no more of it. So the Western attitude toward food insects was an aversion 170 years ago. The insect, of course, was not a cricket. It was, um, it was an orthopteran. It was a tetagonidae. It was a, a neighbor's simplex, the katydid, which is commonly called the Mormon cricket. There are stories from um, other people over, uh, especially in Rwanda, where I worked for a long time, uh, about their joy of collecting grasshoppers and cricket and grasshoppers and locusts and using them uh, for food. Um, there are some. Uh, a little bit more sad stories of um, folks uh, who, professionals, entomologists from France, England, Germany, and the United States, who have been in competition for many decades, actually, to kill grasshoppers and locusts in uh, North and West Africa, and instead preserve the incomplete proteins the millet, wheat, barley, sorghum, and maize, which is very interesting. Um, so we are asking ourselves, uh, why is it that instead of um, assisting, using the funding to assist the people of North and West Africa to capture this complete protein, instead um, developed a lot of uh, um, careful plans to annihilate the complete protein. So here are a few nutritional facts that you probably already know, but it's good to review them. Uh, complete proteins are ones that contain the essential amino acids. For children, my understanding, there's 10 essential amino acids, for, which includes arginine, which for adults is uh, not as necessary. So for adults, there's nine essential amino acids. Uh, here are some other essential amino, I mean, items over in West Africa that provide complete proteins, but these are not so available for children. The chickens, neither chickens, nor cows, nor the other vertebrates. Uh, so we have these international locust patrols that were developed in USAID, PREFAS in France, GTZ in uh, Germany, and the British Locust Control. And so they've essentially um, taken a specific complete protein and uh, done away with it systematically. Now, um, so I'm going to ask you then, um, this seems to be, does it not, a clear case of intercultural uh, or lack of intercultural competence? And so I'm going to be um, passing out a suggestion for you might be able to use in your classes or with any groups that you work with. It's a quiz. We're going to take a quiz here. What does it mean to be interculturally competent in entomophagy? So uh, being passed out now are a quiz with two sections. And uh, I'm going to ask you, first of all, to look at side one. I think he, David might need a little help there. Um, because we want to do this pretty rapidly. One minute. And five. Okay. Um, so I'm going to let you read through it. You probably are going to take it during the last part of the talk. Um, 
we're asking you to look at seven ways of um, expressing an attitude toward food insects. And we all know that you're probably in the highest level of integration, but this helps you maybe explain this to other people. So the first part of the quiz is to choose what phrase or what sentence typifies your attitude toward food insects. Is it representative of denial or defense or minimization or a reversal, which is the opposite of defense or acceptance or adaptation? And most probably it is integration. But this will help you, and there's a, um, a set of um, people uh, who have written about this process. The most um, prominent is probably Milton Bennett, who produced a um, piece of uh, uh, a, an article in uh, 2004. Now, the second part of the quiz is to answer three questions. Have you ever advised a military, um, material resource poor country or a community in a material resource poor country to eliminate grasshoppers or locusts with conventional synthetic pesticides? And there are two other um, questions along with that. But I want to go over to a really important story, and that is a story in a small village in West Africa called Sanambale. There are there, traditional adult foods and traditional children's foods. And what are some examples of their complete proteins are the Senegalese uh, grasshopper and the Sahelian grasshopper. And if you ask children there what they like to snack on, they'll say, oh, these are our favorites. And what do we do? We go out in the bush and we uh, collect these. And then we bring them back and we, um, let, we, we borrow the stove where our dad makes tea and we roast these on a little stick and then we share them with all the other uh, brothers and sisters and the other children we have in our community. Now, um, this is a good idea, of course, because we know that those are complete proteins and we know that the rest of their diet is millet, sorghum, and maize. And without the crickets, or the grasshoppers or locusts, we see kwashiorkor. And this uh, young girl here is one that I know quite well. She survived kwashiorkor, which is an, uh, the old way of saying protein. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and so um, what we see is that without the grasshoppers and without uh, a substitute for it, such as peanuts, which actually have um, another problem, uh, mycotoxins are very prevalent in this part of Africa, and so um, without that, uh, we see the reddish hair, the swollen abdomen, the small stature, and of course there are um, eventually uh, uh, mental development changes as well. So, um, and luckily this little girl recovered. Um, Kwashiorkor is very prevalent in this, um, this village. And um, it's a place where, of course, eggs are not something that they can use because it's not a typical food. And it's sorghum, millet, maize. Cowpeas provide lysine, but not tryptophan. Only the grasshoppers provide the tryptophan. It's possible that um, a fish and chicken guts, which is also okay for children to eat, or cow's milk or goat, goat meat, but they're not um, a typical uh, available food for the children, okay? 
In this particular village, which is a well-run, well, um, uh, well, well-managed village, uh, 23% of the children are either at risk or have kwashiorkor. In the rest of Mali, that is more like 40%. Okay, and so these are some um, figures that show that if they had included the um, grasshoppers or they could continue to include them, it would um, be a good help. Now, um, there's a sad part of the story, and that is that things have changed. The mothers and fathers, particularly the mothers, no longer encourage their children to eat grasshoppers because they know that they know that uh, uh, King Cotton has um, moved into their village, and um, cotton is a good producer of um, cash. However, cotton uses a lot of pesticides, and so they know that the children who would be walking in the cotton fields, taking grasshoppers that might be sequestering the pesticides, and so they tell the kids, no more uh, grasshoppers, stay away from grasshoppers. So, so what? So what is going to happen? So does it matter that many Westerners in influential positions uh, who are probably acting from an ethnocentric background create hunger and malnutrition in the world? What, what are the results? Um, does it matter that these villages disappear, that their children aren't uh, able to resist disease and are um, compromised in a in, in their mental development. Uh, I would say that things that I've seen, such as um, uh, things that we can learn from these villages, like respect for elders, uh, conflict resolution, and uh, many other important things having to do with their traditional wisdom are really important. One of them is able, being able to live with a very small food print and footprint on the same piece of land for millennia. And those are probably things that we're going to need to learn quickly. So isn't the Western attitude changing? Uh, we hope so. And we hope uh, that with this symposium that there are some things that we can do uh, from this moment on. We can first of all listen carefully, we can uh, respect and recognize the importance of food insects with our graduate students, with uh, the review panels that we sit on, and with uh, all the recommendations that we make for our own selves in our research areas. And we can just always be a good example of ethno-relativism and remembering always to respect others traditional wisdom. Okay, thank you.